This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 27, for broadcast on the 1st of March, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, New Horizons detects dusty hints of what could be an extended Kuiper Belt. Discovery of a giant ultra-high-energy gamma-ray bubble in the heart of the Cygnus star-forming region. And a new study shows space travel weakens the human immune system. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New observations from NASA's New Horizons spacecraft are providing hints that the Kuiper Belt might stretch much further out into space than previously thought. The Kuiper Belt is a vast ring of comets, icy debris and frozen worlds circling the Sun out beyond the orbit of Neptune. Now speeding through the outer edges of the Kuiper Belt, almost 60 times further away from the Sun than the Earth, the New Horizons spacecraft is detecting higher than expected levels of dust, tiny frozen remnants of collisions between the Kuiper Belt objects, and particles kicked up by Kuiper Belt objects being peppered by microscopic dust impactors from outside the solar system. The readings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, defy current scientific models, predicting that the Kuiper Belt population and density of dust should start to decline by around 1.6 billion kilometres. Instead, it's contributing to a growing body of evidence suggesting that the outer edge of the main Kuiper Belt could extend for billions of kilometres further than current estimates. Or, alternatively, that there could even be a second belt beyond the one we already know about. The study's lead author, Alex Donner from the University of Colorado Boulder, says New Horizons is making the first direct measurements of interplanetary dust far beyond Neptune and Pluto, so every observation is leading to a new discovery. The idea of an extended Kuiper belt, with a whole new population of objects colliding and producing more dust, offers another clue in solving the mysteries of the solar system's most distant regions. New Horizons is now some 18 years into its historic journey to study the distant world of Pluto and the frozen worlds of the outer solar system. Following its launch back in 2006, the spacecraft reached Pluto and its binary partner Sharon in 2015 and the strange-looking Kuiper Belt object Arakoff in 2019. Its latest surprising results were compiled over three years as New Horizons travelled from 45 to 55 astronomical units out from the Sun. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Sun and the Earth, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. The spacecraft's new readings come as scientists using observatories like Japan's Subaru Telescope in Hawaii have also discovered a number of Kuiper Belt objects far beyond the traditional outer edge of the Kuiper Belt. This outer edge, where the density of objects starts to decline, was thought to be at about 50 astronomical units but new evidence suggested the belt may extend out to 80 astronomical units, or even further. As telescope observations continue, Donna says scientists are looking at other possible reasons for the high dust readings. Now into its second extended mission, New Horizons is expected to have sufficient propellant and power to continue to operate through to the 2040s, by which time it'll be at a distance of more than 100 astronomical units from the Sun. This is space time. Still to come... Discovery of a giant ultra-high-energy gamma-ray bubble in the heart of the Cygnus star-forming region. And NASA's new laser retro-reflector arrays to track lunar missions. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Astronomers have discovered a massive ultra-high-energy gamma-ray bubble deep in the heart of the Cygnus star-forming region. A report in the Science Bulletin claims it's the first time that the origin of cosmic rays with energies higher than 10 petaelectron volts has been identified. The discovery was made using LASO, the Large High Altitude Air Shower Observatory. Cosmic rays are charged particles, mainly composed of protons, which can originate from the Sun, but often also originate from galactic sources in interstellar space. Astronomers use LASA to observe a giant ultra-high-energy gamma-ray bubble-like structure in the Cygnus star-forming region. 
they found it was producing multiple photons exceeding a petaelectron volt inside the structure with the highest reaching 2.5 petaelectron volts. Now all this suggests a supercosmic ray accelerator inside the bubble is continuously accelerating high energy cosmic ray particles into interstellar space. And these particles often have energies up to 20 petaelectron volts. As these high energy cosmic rays collide with interstellar gas, they generate gamma rays, and that's what's producing the bubble. The authors say the intensity of these gamma ray photons is clearly correlated with the distribution of the surrounding gas. And the massive Cygnus OB2 association star cluster near the centre of the bubble is the most promising candidate for the supercosmic ray accelerator. The Cygnus OB2 star cluster is composed of numerous young, hot, massive stars, with surface temperatures exceeding 35,000 degrees Celsius for spectral type O blue stars and 15,000 degrees Celsius for spectral type B blue white stars. The radiation luminosity generated by these stars is hundreds to millions of times that of our sun, and the huge radiation pressure blows away surface material from these stars, forming dynamic stellar winds with speeds up to thousands of kilometres per second. Lasso's observations have also shown that the supercosmic ray accelerator inside the bubble significantly increases the cosmic ray density in the surrounding interstellar space, which far exceeds the average level of cosmic rays in the Milky Way as a whole. Of course, the violent collision of these powerful stellar winds with the surrounding interstellar medium create ideal sites for efficient particle acceleration. Right now, this is the first supercosmic ray accelerator ever identified. But with increasing observation time, Lasso's expected to detect far more supercosmic ray accelerators and hopefully solve the mystery of the origins of cosmic rays in the Milky Way. Lasso is designed to monitor cosmic ray numbers by using a 1 square kilometer ground array consisting of 5,216 electromagnetic particle detectors, 1,188 muon detectors, a 78,000 square meter water Sherenkov detector array, and 18 wide-angle Sherenkov telescopes. The observatory is located at an altitude of 4,410 meters on Mount Hazy in China's Sichuan province. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA's new laser retroreflector arrays to track lunar missions, and a new study shows that space travel weakens the human immune system. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. Imagine for a minute a world where the internet is a safer, freer place, where your digital explorations are shielded from threats, censorship and surveillance. Well, that world doesn't have to be a distant dream, because that's what NordVPN is all about, making the internet a better, safer place than what it is today. And now, during NordVPN's birthday campaign, as a space-time listener, we're giving you an exclusive offer to join this mission. If you sign up for a two-year plan, we'll give you an extra four months free. But remember, this special bonus offer's only available through our unique link. That's nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary. nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary. You see, NordVPN lets you sift the vast universe of the internet with confidence. And of course, it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Whether you're streaming your favorite documentaries, transmitting data across cyberspace, or trying to watch a geoblock sports match, NordVPN gives you the online access you want, and it keeps your activities private and secure. Now remember, this exclusive deal is for space-time listeners only, and you need to go to nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary in order to get it. That's nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary. And as we said before, it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee if you're not completely satisfied. So, what have you got to lose? Go now to nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary. And of course, you'll find the details in our show notes and on our website. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time. Space Time. With Stuart Gary. 
NASA plans to use laser retroreflective arrays to determine the locations of lunar landers and other spacecraft more accurately. The arrays are already being attached to most of the landers forming part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. Laser retroreflectors are small and lightweight, allowing lunar orbiters or landers to locate them on the Moon. The 20-gram devices consist of a small 5-centimetre diameter aluminum hemisphere, which is inset with eight 1.27-centimetre corner cube retroreflectors made of fused silica glass. The arrays are designed to reflect laser light being shone at them from a wide range of different angles. In fact, they're not all that dissimilar to the reflective strips and dots featured on road signs and lane markers to aid in nighttime driving. By shining a laser beam from a spacecraft towards a retroreflector on another ship and then measuring how long it takes for the light to get back to its source, scientists can determine the distance between the two vessels. Laser Retroreflective Array Principal Investigator Jao Li Zun from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says the agency's been placing arrays on satellites and ranging to them from ground-based lasers for several years now. Laser ranging is also used for docking spacecraft with the International Space Station. The laser reflective arrays light up when you shine a light on them, which helps to guide precision docking. And they can also be detected by LIDARs on spaceships far away in order to determine their range and approach speed down to very tight accuracies. The reflectors could also allow spacecraft to accurately range their way to a landing site even without the aid of any external lighting to guide the approach. This means that laser retroreflective arrays can ultimately be used to help spacecraft land in otherwise pitch dark places close to permanently shadowed regions near the lunar south pole, which is a prime target for manned missions because of the resources that could exist there such as water ice. Jaoli Sun says as more landers, rovers and orbiters are sent to the moon equipped with laser retroreflective arrays, NASA's ability to gauge the location of each accurately will improve eventually growing to a network that will allow scientists to determine the exact location of key landers and other equipment, as well as people or specific landmarks more and more accurately, allowing for bigger and better science to be accomplished. So this is a little like a little mirror that's aiming at you all the time, regardless which way you're looking at it. My name is Xiaoli Sang. I'm a LiDAR instrument scientist and also work on other laser instruments. The instrument is a laser retroreflector array. It's a small retroreflectors mounted on the shell, uh, on the aluminum shell, support shell. It retroreflect laser light back to where it came from. The purpose is to, number one, to have a fiducial marker, a precise fiducial marker on the lander so that uh, we know exactly where that is on the lunar surface. It serves as a landmark for future missions if you want to go back and land it there. When you shine laser on it and reflect right back at you, so it doesn't matter which way you're looking at it, and uh, so that will help us to range from orbit to the lander as it passes overhead. That's laser retroreflective array principal investigator Xiaoli Sun from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And this is Space Time. Still to come, a new study shows that space travel weakens the human immune system. And later in the science report, Australian researchers have developed a new, more accurate way of identifying clandestine underground nuclear tests. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study warns that space travel could weaken people's immune systems. The findings, reported in the journal Frontiers of Immunology, suggest that space travel changes the way proteins are built inside white blood cells. Scientists found that protein changes happen rapidly when astronauts reach the International Space Station, making them more susceptible to infectious diseases. The researchers studied the white blood cells of 14 astronauts, including three women and 11 men, who resided aboard the orbiting outpost between four and a half and six and a half months between 2015 and 2019. The analysis showed changes in the way the genes in the blood cells produce proteins that are important for the immunity structure and function of the cells. The authors say that most of the white blood cells return to their typical pre-flight levels within a few weeks to a year after landing 
and that suggests that Earth-level gravity is an important requirement for the human immune system to function optimally. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Niacin, also known as vitamin B3, is used as both a dietary supplement and to fortify flour and cereals. However, a new study warns that it might also be linked to an increased risk of heart disease. The findings reported in the journal Nature Medicine are based on samples of blood taken from over 4,300 people. They found that two byproducts of vitamin B3 are associated with an increased risk of heart disease. And in their tests on humans, they found that one of these breakdown products help increase the amount of pro-inflammation proteins in the lining of blood vessels. Now, while this study can prove directly that niacin causes heart disease, the authors recommend larger studies to further explore the link. Scientists are warning that groundwater stored in aquifers across the globe may be facing declines of over half a metre a year. The findings reported in the journal Nature are based on an analysis of around 170,000 monitoring wells in more than 40 countries. The authors found that about 36% of all aquifers were declining by about 0.1 metres per year, while 12% were declining more rapidly at rates exceeding half a metre annually, and 30% of aquifers had already experienced accelerated depletion in the 21st century. However, the team also noted that 6% of aquifers rose by 0.1%, and 1% rose by half a metre per year although these may be the result of reductions in groundwater consumption, implementation of groundwater consumption policies, surface water transfers, changes in land cover and managed recharge projects. A more accurate way of identifying underground nuclear tests, including those conducted in secret, has been developed by researchers at the Australian National University. A report in the Geophysical Journal International claims the new method allows scientists to more easily determine if their seismometer readings are from a nuclear blast or an earthquake. The new method could help international observers better identify tests being carried out by countries such as Russia, China and North Korea, which possess nuclear weapons and plan on increasing their atomic stockpiles despite UN arms limitation agreements. And then there are rogue nations like Iran. The Islamic Republic, which is the world's largest sponsor of terrorism, is actively trying to secretly develop nuclear weapons and their missile delivery systems under the guise of a scientific space program. Whether you believe in the paranormal or not, for some, there are some very real dangers in going down that road. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says the outcomes depend on whether or not you're just having a bit of fun or whether you're taking the whole thing very seriously. One particular story, which is called the dangers of dabbling in the paranormal, the stance they take is that uh, the paranormal is real. And the dangers they point out are pretty cliched dangers. One is that if you dabble in the paranormal, in the serious, serious, in quotes, end of the paranormal, you might actually open a portal and call in a demon or something like that. And that's when you talk about films, etc., The Exorcist and all mm. sorts of things, where you sort of accidentally, you're sitting there with your Ouija board and suddenly out comes the devil, etc. That's a danger, it's a physical danger, a sceptic might say, uh-huh, <laughs> and let's move along. And really, sort of, there's no overlap between a sceptic here and a... Uh, well, there was very little overlap between a sceptic and a believer. But what there is overlap is that there's probably psychological issues involved. And as a frontline sceptic, I know I deal with people all the time, people who phone me up who are firm believers and who are obviously seriously mentally challenged. Now, whether they are mentally challenged first and have a tendency to believe in the paranormal, I would say that would tend to be the case rather than the other way, that they do something in the paranormal and drives them crazy. The paranormal can play on those vulnerabilities, and that is where it gets to, and that's real. The psychological vulnerabilities are obviously real, and whether it manifests itself through paranormal belief or through paranoia or conspiracy theories or whatever, it is a real danger. And so dabbling with the paranormal is just one way of doing that. It's encouraging you to believe, and then it's encouraging you to take it very seriously, almost obsessively. So there is a real danger there. This article goes on to talk about, is there a valid reason 
for caution, and absolutely there would be. If you have a tendency to believe this stuff, you should, it says go ahead and look at it, but just be careful about how you do it. Uh, there's a balance between caution and exploration, as they call it. This is the column pandering a bit to the believers in the paranormal with a touch of scepticism thrown in. The scepticism is caution. Go in there with your eyes open, and then also you can look at these things, which is fair enough. I mean, skeptics would encourage you to investigate. They don't necessarily do it to encourage you to believe and become seriously involved in it. Do it for fun? Yep, no problems. Do it when you're serious. I've seen the results, and it's not pretty. But I have never seen anyone who has opened a portal to a demon. I've probably seen people who think they might have done, but I've definitely seen people who are vulnerable to strange beliefs, if I could put it that way, and the paranormal has encouraged that. I'm not too worried about opening a portal and the demon popping through. I am a bit about some of their stuff encouraging people who are vulnerable, mentally, financially, emotionally. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 